All right. Should we start? So, sorry, uh, third time for me. Um, I'm also speaking in English as I don't know any French. So I know salut and I think that's it. I, I, I can't even order a beer in French, although I think this is the first most important sentence in every language. But uh, I can say hello world and I think this is the most important sentence for IT. So that's why uh, let's keep it English. Yeah, hey, my name is Heiko. I'm uh, talking about web apps and containers today. Uh, I, should, I just want to give you a short intro of myself. Uh, I'm working for Software One. So I'm, I came in from the legacy Comprex side. So, so uh, those of you who don't know Software One, you might know Comprex. So this is two companies almost the same of size, around 3,000 people that are uh, merged last year. And now as we acquired several other companies, we are almost 8,000 people uh, spread all over the world, but with a strong focus on, on DAH, uh, especially as uh, Software One was founded in uh, Switzerland. And we have a big headquarter in uh, Valisone, so door by door next to Microsoft. Uh, I joined this new company uh, last year, uh, and I worked for the old Comprex 10 years ago already. And then I left and worked for several other companies. Uh, sorry that this uh, slide is in German, the rest one is in English, so no worries. Um, yeah, I came from a uh, IT lead uh, position before, so I, I brought a company in the automotive uh, into the cloud. So I first adopted Office 365 for them and then later brought a new product into Azure. And uh, they are still using it even without me. And obviously it works well enough. Uh, additionally, as, uh, also as uh, Marcel, I'm an MVP, and uh, so I'm speaking in several communities and uh, meetups and stuff like that. So today we are going to talk about app service and then later a little bit about containers. And if you would go to the Azure portal and in the left pane click create resource and you add um, app service, you uh, won't find any service that is called app service. That is just because app service is more like a um, a term for several services underneath it. And uh, so that's why we first should talk about what is that. So number one is the web apps. And if you type in web apps, you will find web apps as a Azure service there. A web app is basically a platform that you can use to run whatever web application you have, as long as it fits to the languages and the frameworks um, that are provided here. So if you have a static website, I will show you in a, in a demo um, how that works. If you have a static website, you can put it there. If you have a .NET website, put it there, Java, Python, PHP, Node.js, yeah, you name it. Under the hood, there is still some kind of servers, but you don't have to take care of that as this is a past service. The second, let's call it instance of um, app service you can get is web apps for containers. It's at the end, it's almost the same. You're running a web app, but in this case, uh, you're not running some code or some Java application. You're running a container inside the app service. This is not AKS, Azure Community Service. This is not ACS. This is not container instance. I will talk about container instance and this type of container later. I will skip AKS for today. So this is a, another option, and this is a quite unknown option to run containers easy and consistent because uh, the container instance, we will see that later, is actually not really made for huge production workloads. This one is. The third way to use the app service is the API apps. I will not talk about that um, today. It's mainly in uh, a service where you can build in apps that are just focused on API. So if you want to have an API that connects several other things, you can use that service as well. So first, when you want to run a web app or a web app for containers, you need something that is called a app service plan, sometimes abbreviated as ASP, app service plan. You cannot run an app service without that. The first time you're trying to uh, spin up a web app, you need to select a app service plan. And if there is no app service plan, you can create one in this, uh, in this dialogue. The app service plan is mostly the compute power that your apps one app or multiple of them uh, can use. So you can compare that to a web uh, container or a, um, a virtual machine to spin up, but at the end it is no full virtual machine or full container. 
under the hood, it is a container. So that is the technical uh, way how it is done. Um, the good thing is you do not need to have a app service plan for every single web app. Web apps can share this app service plan depending on what uh, SKU you have chosen. So the tier gives you a number of maximum apps that you can run inside the same app service plan. The higher or the more expensive the tier is, the more apps can be run in the same app service plan. And uh, the thing is that the app service plan is also the entity that you actually pay for. So you do not pay for the web app. You do not pay for the single container that you spin up. You're paying for the app service plan. And that means it, it totally makes sense to mix and match applications in a app service plan that are sharing a um, similar lifetime or a similar uh, project or whatever, if they can fit into the service plan when it comes to the resources. There's a limit. This uh, app service plan has just a number of recourse and memory. As soon as the limit is reached, you will notice a decrease in performance. So that's why you sometimes need to change from multiple apps in one app service plan into running some of them in, in uh, single app service plans. You can change that at any time. So you can move a running app from one app service plan into another one. So when, let's say, the performance uh, need is higher or you uh, have reached the highest app service plan that is available, this is the latest moment when you need to think about moving an app out of this app service plan. There are several um, differences in the different app service plans you can get. There is a free tier. You don't pay anything for that, but it's no guarantee for resources at all. It's a shared a uh, resource container that you share with other people and you just get, I would say, what others left for you. Then there is the next one that is actually called shared, but it's already paid. You still share resources, but it's very cheap. And then there's the other ones that are more expensive, but you run on your own guaranteed resources. So you select how many ACUs, it used to be weak cores, now it's ACUs, as your compute units, uh, and how much memory you, you need. Uh, and then you select the appropriate app service plan. The problem here is that there is only double double. So you cannot say, oh, I need like a little bit more memory, but I don't need double the course. As soon as you need to double the memory, you also need to double the course, need to switch to the next SKU, which also doubles the price at the end. And uh, what you also will notice is that if you compare the pricing of a app service plan, when it comes to its resources, to a virtual machine, there's a huge difference. So let's say the, the smallest instance of a virtual machine you can run uh, is comparable to the smallest instance of um, app service plan, but it's five times the price. This is just because someone else is taking care of stuff that you do not take care uh, of anymore, like the uh, SLAs, like uh, high availability, like backup and things like this. This is all baked in into the um, app service. So you can see if you take a look on the um, docs, that there is a difference when it comes to the features. The higher you go, the more features you get. Like here, auto scale, you need to have at least the standard SKU. You don't get auto scale in the, uh, in the basic, which does not, need, uh, does not uh, mean that you cannot scale it. You still can scale, but you need to scale it manually. Here, you can create a, um, let's call it a plan, where you say, okay, when this happens, then please scale in that manner. Like if um, CPU consumption over five minutes is above 80%, please add another one instance, or please double the number of instances. And if it is below 60%, take one instance offline. You still need to consider that scaling up is easy. Scaling down might be not so easy when it comes to your application, because you're just closing an instance of your application that might still hold data. So this is something also the, the app needs to be able to handle. And as you can see, this is the pricing always for the smallest instance of that SKU. So you can add up uh, paying more in premium uh, if you take not the smallest, but let's say the second smallest or the, the biggest um, instance type you can get. You also see that there's this isolated thing. I will talk about that later. It's called app service environment. Uh, I have some slides about that also. Yeah, that's what I already said. The pricing compared to a uh, VM is different. And I also want to add that when you use Azure Functions, or now it's called Function App, they can also run inside an app service plan, which has or might have several advantages. Usually, an Azure Function is built by the amount of usage, gigabytes per second. So the more you use it, the more expensive it is. 
That means you cannot really say how much you will spend at the end of the month. But you can run a function in a different way, which is called the app service plan way versus the consumption way, where you assign the function to a app service plan and you just pay the, let's say, flat amount of money that this app service plan costs you over the time. You also uh, fixed to the performance that this app service plan has, so you cannot consume more as the app service plan has. A regular as a function and consumption has nearly no limit, so you can spin it off, I don't know, a dozen of times. In an app service plan, limited performance, but also a very, very good calculatable uh, amount of money you will spend for that. Yeah, just the whole uh, screenshot for that. All right, let's do a small demo on that. Hopefully that is something you can see even in the last row. So I have the Azure portal here with me. And the first thing to note is there is this, where's this mouse? Okay. Um, first thing to know is I have a resource group here. There is already an app service plan. You might see this small penguin here. This is an app service plan for Linux. You cannot mix and match app service plans for Linux and Windows in the same RG. That means if I want to create a new app service plan, I need to create a new resource group or use another one. You cannot use this one that's already there. So if I would use this one, uh, I will get a decline in the, in the review stage, in the last stage before it is created. Yeah, I know. Ask Microsoft. I don't know. <laughs> there's, there, when it comes to uh, app service, I will also mention a few other things. When it comes to app services, there are some few things you cannot mix and match, and especially when it comes to Windows app service plans. Linux is more flexible. Windows is not. Okay, let's just call it um, the same like the other one, but at um, a win here. So now I need to put the name of this um, uh, app service plan. I just call it app service plan um, win one. We'll just make it Windows. I say I want to have this in, it's not available for, um, oh, it is. It was not available for Switzerland a couple of days ago. So now I can put it in Switzerland. And here is the size. As I said, it's not in um, CPU cores, it's in ACUs, but roughly above the thumb, 100 ACU is roughly one V core. It depends on what CPU you're using, that's why it's um, ACUs now, because a V core of, let's say, a Pentium 4 hyperthreading is totally different from a Xeon uh, V3, I don't know, 3000 something. So that's why it's ACUs now. As I already said, the higher uh, tier you use, the more features you get. So if I go down to, let's say, the D1 or even the B1, you see there's just a few features here. There's no auto scale. And there's also some limits on, on storage and stuff. But the higher I go, the more features I get, like auto scaling here. I get the staging slots. We'll talk about that later. I get more storage. I get things like traffic manager and so on and so on. And then there's premium. I just get more of everything plus um, a higher SLA. Okay, for now, I think S1 is fine. Just pick that put some tags here, so just put tags always, even if it's just one tag, and then let it create. Takes just a few seconds, and in the meanwhile, I will talk about my, uh, my next slides. All right, so first, this was the app service plan. You will always need that. So now when we create a web app, I need to select if that is a web app based on code or ba based on container, as you can see here in the screenshot. I will also show that in the demo. So you need to select that. Plus, you need to select whether you want to run Linux or Windows. So you can have code with Linux, code with Windows, container with Linux, and container with Windows. So all four options are available. And then you also, and I will show that in the demo, you will also need to select what runtime stack to use, like what PHP version, what Node.js version, what Java version. Uh, and then under the hood, you could also select, let's say if you want to use Java, uh, what uh, version uh, are you going to use, what GRE version, you want to run it on Tomcat or something else. So there's more options to choose later. And the region, of course. So you do not need, and that's important, you do not need to decide what to run on it yet. So you just say, I want to have this or that version, and that's it. So you do not upload something here, or you do not connect it to some, some Git or so. It's, first of all, it's just an empty um, web app. 
So for web apps that are based on Linux, as you can see here, they can run both together in the code and the container version. You can see that also here in the same app service plan, Linux. When it comes to Windows, this is not possible. When you want to run code and container-based Windows app services, you need to have two app service plans, and they cannot exist in the same RG on top of that. So the easy way is go with Linux. If you need Windows, a little bit more complicated. When it comes to Linux, a lot of stuff is still in preview. That means you get no SLAs, but you get cheaper pricing. So if you just want to do some testings here, Linux might be a better option, but for production workloads, for now you need to select Windows if you need to have an SLA. So when you run this with code, you have several options how to deploy your stuff to the app. Number one is you just go the traditional approach, you have a zip with whatever you want to use, your static website, your PHP application, whatsoever, and then you just upload the zip. There's several options for that. One is um, FTP or SFTP, meaning uh, SSH under the hood or SCP. Uh, you can also use uh, REST APIs, and you can also uh, use some, some built-in tools. I will also show that. Another option is go with WAR when it comes to Java applications. And then you can just connect the app uh, through this, it's called Deployment Center, to several sources that um, might um, provide your application. So this could be a GitHub or a Bitbucket or even an FTP server. And then you can say, okay, I want to have continuous CI CD. And that means as soon as someone uploads something new to the FTP or put something on the, on the GitHub, the system will grab that and put it on the, on the app service. Could be something good for de development or for testing, might be not the best solution for production workloads that during the day when a developer is uploading stuff to some system internally, your production system reboots. Uh, because what you will see is even if there is no VM and stuff, it might happen that starting your application takes some time. So in the company where I worked before, we had a lot of Java applications, and that was one of them that created some kind of a bigger cache, and it took 15 minutes to spin up that application. So usually that is not a problem if you do that in a maintenance window. But if that application reboots during the day, you have a 15-minute downtime. So in this case, you need to consider either running multiple instances in parallel, which is no problem. So you can say, okay, I don't need just one, I need five which lowers the chance that all five are gone at the same time. Um, or you need to put certain um, configuration marks, tags, to prevent certain things, like to prevent auto-rebooting. There's also a feature, it's called auto-healing. This auto-healing is trying to figure out if your application is still running, and it's, it basically triggers the HTTP response code. And if the response code is not like it is expected to be, it's rebooting your application. Even if the status code that it got was the one that is right for your application, it will just restart your application. So that's why you need to think about if you have longer rebooting times to disable one of these features. What you also can do is blue-green deployment, or you can have blue-green-red deployment, or blue-green-red-yellow deployment. You can put as many colors as you want. So for those of you who are not familiar with, with development, this basically means you have two instances or two versions of your application. One is the one that is currently in production and is used by your customers. The other one is like a, let's call it cold standby. And now you can just replace the version in the cold standby solution and then just swap them. You just say, okay, make green, blue, and blue, green. So whatever you put in newly immediately becomes the new production version without the need of changing any DNS records. It's already spin up, so you do not you will not change that before it is spin up. So you will wait until it's spin up, but you can immediately switch between your old version and the new one and the back. So even in the case you notice that there's some problem with the new version, maybe there was something that was not tested or whatever, you can immediately switch back to the old version as long as you do not have replaced the, let's call it the bucket where you put the old version. So that's also very, very useful. All right, so now let's deploy some app service onto the new app service plan that we have created. So here is, here is the app service plan. There's nothing in it. We can see apps is zero up here. And now I just create a new resource. I just keep that in my clipboard in case I forget it. Uh, just call it app win, win one. Let's see if, oh, web app first. 
first. All right, we put it in the, where is my resource group? That's interesting. <clears throat> Let's check that out. Okay, that's fine. Again, web app. I thought I put that in a different resource group. Okay, we go here. So let's see if that works. App uh, when one I guess is already taken, because it needs to be unique. Oh, it's it's free. It needs to be unique name. As you can see, it is added by a DNS suffix. That's why it needs to be unique. Um, so now I can select code or container. For now, I select code. I can select the um, runtime stack like .NET, ASP, Java. As I said, everything is here. Uh, you will see that usually the super newest version of things is mostly not here, especially when it comes to non-Microsoft stacks, like for Java. This is just because Microsoft is supporting that stack. That means they need to test it first. So that's why whenever some new things come up, it takes time till you will get it here. And you usually do not get very old versions. So usually it's like everything in Azure, you get something like the newest version plus two older ones. So I select .NET uh, 3.0, which is basically .NET Core here. I go with Windows, put that in um, Switzerland as well. Here is my app service plan, which I've selected. If there was no app service plan up to now, here's the option to create a new one. I see, but I cannot change the uh, size of that. And now I can go through the rest. I do not want to have app insights. I just put another tag here, project, this one. And then we just create this app. This also takes yeah, like a minute or so, which gives me the time to have some drink. All right, here we are. So what we have right now is basically an empty web app, but there is some default application already on it just to, to see if it is working. So here is my DNS name. I can just open that in a new tab. And that is my demo default whatever website. So it's a static website uh, with some links. Uh, you can easily replace that. And um, yeah, how that works, you will see in like a minute. What else do we see here? We see all the, yeah, let's say basic information. We see what app service plan is that running on. What you should keep in mind is that when you go down here and say scale up, this means we want to increase the performance. We are not really scaling up this single web app. We are scaling up the app service plan below it. That means all the other applications running on the same app service plan will also get the new size. For increasing the size, this might not be a problem at all, but for decreasing it will be, especially when it comes to features. So I could also decrease from the standard down to basic, which will remove some of the features. So that's why always keep that in mind when changing the uh, SKU for a uh, web app under the hood, you're changing the SKU for the app service plan. So what else do we have here? We have configuration. There's a big, uh, big part here. So we can put application settings here. Whatever you put here is an environment variable inside your application. So you can use that when your uh, developers are providing you some things like a connection string is a, is a bad example because there's also connection strings here. But if you have something that is like a connection string, but not really a database connection string, let's say you have a uh, storage account in Azure, and your, your um, developers don't know, or they should not know what storage account you're using. So you can provide that through an, um, an application setting or something else like this. Then we have the general settings. So here we can select a lot of other options. So we can change at any time our stack. And uh, we can change some other options down here. There's something that is called always on. Always on is a feature that you might need to select depending on what service plan you're using. In some of the app service plans, it is switched off by default. And that means if your application was not used for some time, it is kind of idle. So it's brought down in a hibernate mode. And when the next one is trying to um, access this website, it needs some seconds to spin up again. This is just to save performance in your app service plan for applications that are not really needed. But if you have an application that you want to have 24-7, you don't want to have it hibernating, you should uh, switch on always on, which also means your application is constantly consuming performance in the app service plan. 
There's other things you can enable or disable here, like what uh, HTTP version you want to have. Uh, there's other options uh, that you can set, like, like certificates, HTTPS, and, and things like that. Uh, and then there's things like default documents, path mappings, so things you might know from an IIS or from an Apache server uh, when it comes to, an, to a web server. And then there's plenty of other options. I don't want to talk about all of them because it's just too much. There's one down here. This is the one that uh, gives you the option to switch this one app to another app service plan in case performance is not enough or there might be some problems between two applications or things like that. All right. So now how it is when it comes to, to the container option. When you deploy a um, web app with container option, you then need to choose where the container comes from. The default option is a single container. There's also a Docker Compose preview feature where you can just put in a Docker Compose JSON file, or you just put in some plain text out from a JSON file for Docker Compose. Uh, and this gives you the option to also run multiple containers, even with some uh, configuration between them, like a shared network or some shared storage or stuff like that. But it's still a preview. And the other feature, like here, single container, gives you at first three options where is the image coming from. Either it is an Azure Container Registry, it is Docker Hub, or it is some whatever private registry, wherever you run that. Could be on your on-premise network, could be inside a VM on Azure, could be somewhere else. If it is Docker Hub, you can say, is that a public uh, available image, or do you need to log in to get it? And then you just put here image and tag name, and maybe if you need that, a, a startup file. So if the container does not know what to do when it comes up, you can put a, a startup file here. There's also this continuous deployment feature here. So if I switch that to on, as soon as someone else uploads a new Docker Hub image for that tag, it will get the, the version. That is the place where it totally makes sense to use this tag feature here. Because right now, if I just put engine X, it will always use what is double double uh, latest. But you could also say, I want to have engine X uh, 1.5. And it will stay on 1.5 until you change that number. So then it is still kind of continuous deployment, but with a fixed version. OK. Um, as I said, this is not what you might know as Azure Container Instance. It's, it's another uh, here. OK, how does that look? And um, and that's pretty much the same way uh, for now. I just create a new resource. I just say it's a web app. There's no separate resource for web apps for containers. Um, I'm running it in the same resource group. I say this is an app Linux container one. I don't have that yet. I say it's Docker container based on Linux because now I can. No, I can't. Okay, let's see. Anyone that's also fine. Uh, Docker container based on Linux in. Oh, yeah. This is in, I think the other one is in West Europe. Yeah. So I can use the already pre existing um, ASP here. Next, I need to select what kind of container single container, quick start image. I also can say, give me something from Docker Hub, as I say. I could also like Nginx. And Nginx. Um, and I could add some more things like tags and application inside and stuff. Just put in a project tag here. Right. So depending on what kind of container you've chosen and how big that is, it could take some time because now after the, uh, the application itself was spin up, it needs to get the container, it needs to uh, unpack that, it needs to spin it up. So the bigger the container is, the longer it might take. I think for this one, it's also something like one or two minutes. All right. <clears throat> So it pretty much looks the same like the other one. So we still have our um, public DNS name here. You can open that, but as you can see, it takes some time. If you go down here to the container settings, you get the log. So here we can see what happens right now. It's loading. Not sure everyone can, can see that. 
All right, let's see how far it's come. All right, it's um, slower than expected today. Because every instance will get the image and will spin it up. So there it is. And now we can also see that it already started like a minute ago, and it's just the, the log that took the time. Uh, you can see it's downloading it, and it's extracting it. And at the end, we will see something like running. And it's ready to serve requests. OK. So and now this is the container. We can use it. That's it. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, you can also change almost everything, like version name, the way how to get the container. So you can start with some Docker things, and then later you switch to private registry. Um, everything very, very smooth. All right. So now what if someone comes to you and says, hey, Joe, I need RDP or SSH access to get the log files from my web server. This is usually something developers are asking. Uh, especially when there is something in production they've never seen before, and this is impossible because it is almost tested, and so now someone needs to fetch a log. All right, so the problem here is there is no RDP, and there's mostly no SSH into a web app or an app service because there's just no web server. But the good thing is you can use plenty of options to get your file and to do other things. So there is a CUDA console, I will show you that. There is a web SSH, there is REST APIs, and there are several other options that you can use. You can even use Azure CLI to run a command against your uh, container where the application is running and say, hey, please uh, deliver this file under this directory. So that's also something that works. In the company I worked before, I just built simple Jenkins jobs for that, and that just gave the developers an option to say, okay, I need this specific log file or this pattern. Please get me everything from my, my server uh, that has this pattern or this name and then just send it out as a zip file. It's pretty easy, just, I would call it a one-liner. It's not a one-liner because the whole PowerShell script needs a little bit more to look good. But the REST call itself is just a one-liner. Uh, and then you just get the file or the files you want to have, uh, and you can just deploy it somewhere else. Okay, how does that look? And what else can we do with this Kudu console? So when we, when we go to the, um, to the Windows, containers, because that is the, the one that looks most impressive. So there's this Win application here. We can scroll down here. There is something that's called console. Just ignore that. There's something that's called advanced tools. We always want to go advanced. And there is a go button here, very small, hidden. It basically takes your URL and adds um, a, 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 small, a small name in here. It's SCM. So that is the name AppWin1, AzureWebsites.net is the name of the, of the web application itself. Here. So the trick is if you know your application's URL, you do not always need to go through the portal. You just can add SCM. Makes it easier to find that. So here we have the back console for either CMD or PowerShell. So CMD is basically the Windows Bash. Um, or here we have um, the PowerShell. And uh, we can do, do things like whatever PS version table, and we see this is a PowerShell 6, I guess. Oh, no, it's a 5.1. Okay, that's fine. Um, so whatever PowerShell you want to run, you can do that here. It's not as handy as some other uh, IDEs. There is no uh, uh, auto-completion or things like this. So you really need to type here, but that's okay. Um, but what is very good is you can browse through your directory here, and you can uh, download your files. You can uh, delete them, or you can just change them on the fly. Um, there's also, this is an editor where you can just go and search, and it also supports regular expressions, which your browser does not. Um, so it's, it's very useful. You have things like the Process Explorer showing you what processes are running. I mean, right now there's not really that much. I think it's just the IIS. Um, but if your application would spin up more processes, you would see that here, and also what memory it uses and stuff like that. And then you can see tools, and there's something that's called zip push deploy. That can be used to, to just deploy an application um, right into your, your web, uh, web app. So I should have something on my desktop. 
which is a zip file right here. We just drag and drop that. So now it takes a few seconds to upload. Usually we should see some Swiss knife up here. Okay, let's do it the other way. Okay, that looks better. Yeah, that's the Swiss knife. So now it's just uploading the file, it's extracting the file, it's getting everything in the right directory, and now it says deployment successful. Uh, this is the same URL we used before. I just do the refresh, and now here we go. This is the application. This is a, a very easy, static, not even PHP website, very small, very easy, uh, but the same would work for .NET Core, Java, whatever you want to use. So there is CUDA, CUDA console uh, where you can use for a lot of things. You also can see all your environment variables you put. So in case something is missing, you can see, is it here, is it not here? Uh, you see your directories, things like that. You cannot break out of the container. <laughs> so there's things you cannot do here. You can't even uh, stop the IIS. Doesn't work. Okay, that's CUDA console. So I've spoken about a um, isolated environment at the beginning when I showed you the, the several options you have. And that was the one that called isolated. This is a different service. It's called app service environment. It's kind of very old. And nowadays I don't really see the huge need for that. But just in case you are the only one of all in this room that might have a use case for it, um, I should quickly talk about it. So usually when you deploy in web app, as you have seen, it has a private endpoint. There was times when this private endpoint was the only way to use an application in an app service. There was no option for private endpoints or to limit the usage of this um, uh, public endpoint. Now there is options. So as for a lot of bigger uh, Microsoft services, you can either use a private endpoint or at least you can say, I want to have something like a five-tuple firewall and say, okay, just this and that, source URLs uh, are allowed to access that. But still, your web app runs on the same system like other companies, other customers of Azure uh, might use. So that means it's, it's not isolated from the other ones. It might happen that there is some, some conflict or some attacks and breaches between your applications and the applications of other ones. And that is the moment when an ASE comes into play. Deploying an ASE gives you a totally isolated environment. The deployment itself takes hours because it, it, it looks like someone is going and taking a big server and bringing it to some rack and putting it in for you, especially just for you, putting a label and stuff. I mean, at the end, it is still some shared resource somewhere, but it is more isolated than the, the regular way. Plus, it has no public endpoint at all unless you say, I want to have it. So there's some options you can use. Did I put it here? Uh, yeah, here. You can use this external ASE. There you get an external IP address. Otherwise, it's just connected to a, a VNet. So let's say you have an application that is just a back-end application for some other front-end. You do not need to expose it to the internet. You could put that in an AC. The KV tier is there's a stamp fee just for the AC itself. There's nothing running it. It's just the AC. It's around 1,000 uh, euro per AC a month. Plus, every app you put in is way more expensive than it would be if you run it in a traditional app service plan. The cheapest one is 250 euro per app. So this isolation has a price. So that's why I say there's not that much use cases for this nowadays. Already V2, uh, but still, yeah, kind of deprecated because of the, the features of the traditional app service uh, got more and more better. Okay, this is just the pricing calculator that you can see. Okay, this is my instances I want to have. The smallest one, almost 200 uh, euro. My stem fee, almost 1,000 euro. Yeah. All right, now about the other option, how to run uh, containers without taking care of any servers. And I mean, to be honest, an AKS is not serverless. If you deploy an AKS, you get VMs. And you need to take care of things like updating your AKS. So it is not the same like this uh, container instance or even the app service with containers. A Azure container instance is comparable, I would say, to an Azure function. It's also serverless like an Azure function. It's all also built like an Azure function. So you are paying for the vCores and the memory you're using over time. If no one uses your container and the container uh, hibernated, 
you don't pay anything. As soon as your container spins up because someone is using it, you pay for that. This is different from AKS, where you pay as long as the virtual machine is running. And it's also different from the app service with containers, where you're paying 24-7 as long as the app service plan is existing. You can stop a web app, but you can't stop the billing for an app service plan. The only option to stop it is deleting it. Here, you can stop. You can either stop your container by just clicking the stop button, so it just stopped, it's, it's off. You can't pay anything for it because you can't use it anymore. Or you just keep it running and it is hibernating by itself and it's just spinning up as soon as someone uses it. And then you just pay for the consumed performance over time. The good thing here is that has a hypervisor isolation. So the containers that you're running, as long as they are not running in the same container group, are really isolated as they would be isolated as a VM. And that is different from having, let's say, Docker on a VM running several VM-based uh, uh, containers there because they will share the kernel. Here we have a real hypervisor isolation with no kernel sharing at all. Means that even if one of your containers uh, gets into your kernel and, and does some malicious damage there, the other containers are not affected unless they run in the same container group. You can group containers. We do not need to. Okay, how does that look? And for that, uh, I will go a different way. I'll just use the shell here. Okay, do that. And as I'm lazy, I prepared this. Okay, what do we run here? We run AZ container create. We give the name for the container. We give the name for the image I want to have. In this case, it's again from the Docker Hub. If I do not specify a URL in some format, it's always Docker Hub. But I can also use container registry. I can use my private registry, whatever I want to have. In this case, I might need to provide more uh, information like logins and stuff. This is the RG, and I want to have it with a public IP address. It's an option. You do not uh, need to do that. All right, put it here. kind of really quick, usually. Okay, I can also note here is, and we will see it in the next step, when we do not specify the OS, it's always Linux. Don't ask me why. I mean, it's still Microsoft, right? Okay, here we are. Uh, we get some information. We also see, okay, that's 480, that's open. Uh, you should see the IP address somewhere. Uh, we also can see that in the portal, for sure. So here is my ACI engine X. Here's the IP address. For now, there is no FQDN. I just get an IP address. And there is my container. <clears throat> so we can see there is just, just one container in this container group. It's running. Yeah, and there's a lot of other things you can use here, like metrics and stuff. The other one, which is a Windows container, it's an IIS. Here, we need to say, always type Windows. Otherwise, this would run into a, a problem because you cannot run IIS, this IIS on the left. Okay, same here. Put that, spin it up. The way it is running, you can see here, there's an option to stop the container. So in this case, we stop the billing. We can also restart it if that is needed. Otherwise, it is just running by itself. So you do not need to take care of it. No, it's charged when you are when it's running. Yeah, yeah. There is some idle time. After that, it is going in in some hibernate status. Then you do. But as long as it is as it is running, you might be charged because someone might use it. If it is stopped, you do not, because no one can use it. What do you mean scaling? Like like performance? No. 
it's 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 like like an Azure function. You cannot say, oh, give me more, more, more. Um, in, in this case, it's just what it is. What you can do is when you when you create that either through the command line or through the portal, or let's do it through the portal. Uh, you can say how much vcores you want to have. Um, Azure Container. Uh, where's my Chrome? There we go. Great. Okay, just to to show how that looks like. Container name test one two three. I'm lazy today. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, okay, so the issue is fine for me now. Okay, we'll have engine X, and down here you can say, okay, what performance you want to have. You can even uh, enable GPU if that is needed, or how much core of the memory. And they do not need to um, stick to each other. So you can have a lot of cores with few memory, or just few cores with a lot of memory, but you pay for the gigabytes and the cores additionally. So there is kind of uh, two uh, calculation matrices for the price at the end. So the more C uh, CPUs you have, even if they are not used, you will pay for them. Uh, and the more memory you have, even if it's not used, you also pay for that. Uh, okay, so it's still doing. Yeah, the thing with this container instance is it is in many cases not really made for production workloads because there is things happening like auto restarts and stuff that you cannot really control. So I would use this container instance mostly for developers that quickly need to spin up things to just test something and then just get rid of it again. Um, or if you have some, let's say you, you just want to extend your AKS. You have an AKS of a certain amount of nodes, and now you have some, some peak and you want to have five more container instances, then you can also use container instance to extend your AKS. You do not need to spin up more AKS nodes. You can also use a, um, the, the container instance. Uh, there might there might be use cases for it, but I will not run a, a web application something like this in a production workload on a, a container. Yeah. Or AKS, if you're fine with all the overhead that you might have when it comes to the the uh, configuration and maintenance and stuff. All right, this is just running. Let's just trust me that this will work. Okay, so now there's uh, plenty of options what to use when, and Microsoft gives us this really nice chart here where you can see, okay, what is your way to go based on some easy decisions like migrate or build new, full-fledged orchestration, web app, web API, containerize, stuff like that. And you can see it will offer either app service, this is the uh, containerized versions, um, AKS, virtual machines, and then down here, some other options like batch functions, stuff like that. So this is something to start with when you need to decide what service to use. I would always recommend really trying out the service you decide on because this service usually works totally different from everything that you have seen before if you're on an on-prem world and even if you're already in the cloud because they have some of them that you should know of. It's also really good insights that you get like for, for your um, app services, when you, you notice is, is it crashed or something, there's a, a helping tool. You can just put crash as a word and it comes up with several um, options. And one is show me all my crashes and the timestamps and why they happened and status code and responses and stuff like that. And you also get a lot of uh, information from it, like how to prevent certain things from happening, like how to prevent an auto start, stuff like that. So there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of help built into it. Uh, but you also give away control, like for most of past services. <laughs> is, is, there, is there any question either on uh, the technical part or whatever Oscar right now said? <laughs> if that is not the case, then thank you for your attendance. There is some uh, contact details. I guess we will share the slides in some way. Um, so there you get also the, the contact details in case needed. Uh, and then, yeah, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>